So today we're going to talk about Parkinson's disease. Let's start by discussing the background information. Um, overall, uh, from a historical perspective, not necessarily extraordinarily important uh, for the boards, but interesting to know that it was actually originated, the diagnosis, in 1817. So it's been around for a significant amount of time. And at the time, uh, it was used to describe a plethora of symptoms, uh, and it was in an essay called uh, An Essay on the Shaking Palsy. So that can kind of summarize one type of Parkinson's, which is the uh, Parkinson's that has tremor, uh, tremor-dominant tremor dominant Parkinson's. But let's go right into the etiology. So it's pretty unknown uh, for the most part. There are some risk factors. Most of this is theoretical. Uh, there are theories that pesticides or herbicides may actually be a toxin that can cause Parkinson's. Um, there's a strong genetic theory that uh, there is a Parkinson's gene uh, for early onset Parkinson's, and early onset Parkinson's begins approximately around age 40. Uh, in addition, there's definitely uh, risk factors associated with head trauma. People that have had head trauma are 3.8 times higher uh, to have Parkinson's. Factors that actually reduce risk are cigarette smoking and caffeine consumption. So one of the few times in, in the world when you could say cigarettes and caffeine are very good for you. So idiopathic Parkinson's disease, uh, this is, in general, when you hear Parkinson's, it's referring to idiopathic, basically meaning that there's no true known cause, just presents itself. That said, family history is considered a uh, risk factor. Uh, there was a study on, uh, in the 1980s on a group of individuals that were taking a certain type of synthetic drug, MPTP, and they actually did present with Parkinson's later in life. So this kind of opened the researchers' eyes to the possibility of a drug uh, causing Parkinson's. Uh, however, there are numerous people that have Parkinson's that never had these drugs or any illicit drugs for that matter. So epidemiology, incidence is fairly high, 60 to 120 out of 100,000 people. 1% uh, of the population over 55 presents with Parkinson's, but it is increasing uh, as you get older, 2.6% by the age of 85 years old. 10% of all cases develop their symptoms before the age of 40, and that's called young onset or early onset. 40% uh, of the cases may be undiagnosed at any given time. So... It's commonly seen in men, more than women, at a 3 to 2 ratio. There's conflicting data about ethnicity. Uh, however, most of the data confirms that there's lower prevalence among black and Asian individuals. The mean age at onset is in the early to mid-60s. There's been a recent surge of young onset, or also known as early onset Parkinson's, uh, which actually is occurring in about 5 to 10% of cases, and is generally diagnosed between 21 and 40. Clinically, I can say that I've seen a significant rise in early onset Parkinson's. And the good news here with early onset Parkinson's is that it responds extremely well to uh, exercise. In fact, uh, there's research showing that high intensity exercise performed in the appropriate way can actually reduce the impacts of Parkinson's and in some cases slow the progression, if not stop it altogether. So there's some really good upcoming research in this category. Relevant anatomy is something that you've discussed already in uh, your uh, basic neuro course, although I also have an accompanying video uh, detailing the basic ganglia and essentially what would cause Parkinson's versus what would cause Huntington's. So I suggest you watch that video as well. So pathophysiology of Parkinson's, again, this is um, something that's going to be covered in that additional video that you can go through and uh, closely take a, a good look at the basal ganglia. Okay, so this part here is all covered in that separate video. Um, now, classifications of Parkinson's. Uh, so, to start off, it is a movement disorder. It's one of many. Um, Parkinson's and Huntington's disease are the two of the more common movement disorders, along with ataxia, dystonia, myoclonus, amongst others. Um, Parkinsonism, or Parkinsonism, uh, refers to a group of disorders producing abnormalities in the basal ganglia. So you have idiopathic Parkinson's disease, which is of unknown etiology and the most common form. You have a secondary Parkinsonism, which is due to uh, an identifiable cause, such as head trauma or drug use. And then you have atypical Parkinsonism, uh, also known as Parkinson's Plus syndrome, 
uh, and that's usually due to a neurodegenerative disorder. So there are a number of atypical Parkinson, Parkinsonism features. Uh, an abrupt onset with rapidly progressive course is not typical for Parkinson's, but and if you do see that, it is generally going to be the atypical form, which will have a stronger progression and uh, worse prognosis. Early onset of rapidly progressing dementia is most definitely uh, another atypical uh, item here. In general, Parkinson's disease does not cause dementia until the very late stages. Um, symmetrical, axial, and early gait and balance impairments, again, very atypical. So as we're going through this, essentially you can determine the typical Parkinsonism presentation because it's the exact opposite of these. But we'll go through that shortly too. Um, upward and downward gazing palsy. Uh, this is something that's very unique to atypical Parkinson's. Uh, when a person looks up or looks down, they'll actually have a palsy, a slower, uh, slower movement with their eyes, uh, and this will actually cause freezing and uh, potential falls. Upper motor neuron signs and cerebellar signs. These are not typically common with Parkinson's, although Parkinson's is an upper motor neuron disease. It doesn't present with your standard upper motor neuron signs. Urinary incontinence, atypical. Early symptomatic postural hypotension, uh, early postural instability, and unresponsive to L-DOPA or carbidopa, which is the medication that predominantly treats Parkinson's. So essentially what we're saying here, there is a there is a disease called atypical Parkinson's. And atypical Parkinson's is not actually Parkinson's, but it presents in many ways like it, although it's much more progressive in nature, and it has these symptoms which differ from typical or idiopathic Parkinson's, I should say. So another form of atypical Parkinson's is progressive supranuclear palsy, or PSP. Um, this is where you're gonna have significant difficulty looking up and down. Uh, upright posture is difficult and frequent falls are common. Uh, there's pseudobulbar emotional issues, so a person will have a lot of emotional lability, uh, furrowed brow or a stare. These are common symptoms of PSP, and again, PSP is an atypical form of Parkinson's that progresses rapidly and ultimately has a more severe prognosis. And then you have cortical basal ganglia degeneration. Uh, this is unilateral coarse tremor limb apraxia, and dystonia. Uh, again, a uh, significantly worse prognosis. And there's MSA, multiple system atrophy. The, there's a specific name for this, which is shy drager syndrome. It's an autonomic insufficiency, so the person presents with Parkinson's symptoms, but also with uh, orthostasis and impotence, uh, and ultimately has a um, more of a severe progression. So the overall progression for normal or typical Parkinson's disease is going to be unilateral to bilateral. So a person should never present with their first symptoms being bilateral in typical Parkinson's. They'll almost always present unilateral to bilateral. Appendicular to axial, so the peripherally before it comes to the central uh, axial skeleton. Uh, they'll have slowly increasing akinetic rigidity, postural balance, and gait disturbance motor initiation or difficulty free with freezing, speech swallowing, drooling problems. Uh, they'll have some non-motor symptoms. Um, medications do typically work though. Um, however, over time, you'll see a reduction in the efficacy of the medications. Secondary Parkinsonism, the general causes are drug-induced, toxin-induced, metabolic, structural lesions, hydrocephalus, or infections. So when it comes to Parkinson's, uh, it's an area that's very well studied, and it's an area that uh, we have very strong predictive numbers. Uh, so you can utilize a number of the outcome measures to determine a person's prognosis or their performance or their potential to progress with Parkinson's. So the main ones here are the PD progression rating scale, UPDRS, sit to stand, modified Ashworth, Berg, DGI, and time get up and go. So for these tests, you'll if you haven't learned these in other classes, you'll actually be performing most of these in other classes. Uh, the Parkinson's disease progression rating scale is a 0 to 5 scale with a couple point fives, uh, and it actually mirrors almost identically the modified honen uh, The most common uh, way of describing an individual with Parkinson's is, or their functional performance, I should say, is by utilizing the honen scale. So you need to be sure that 100% that you know the Honen-Yar scale. 
Stage zero, no signs of disease. Stage one, unilateral. 1.5 is unilateral plus axial. Two, bilateral. 2.5 is mild bilateral with recovery on a pull test. And the pull test is uh, if the person is standing, the therapist stands behind them, pulls backwards on their shoulders, and a person with 2.5 would lose their balance slightly backwards but recover quickly. However, a person with a 3 would actually have very significant difficulty recovering from the pull test, and you would have to catch them falling backwards. Stage 4 is severe disability. Still able to walk and stand, unassisted though. And stage five is generally wheelchair or bedridden. The UPDRS is a major scale. It's a large scale. It has five primary parts. Uh, and it measures cognitive and emotional status, ADL, motor function, side effects of medication, and the honin yar. Uh, it is pretty significant. It includes postural instability tests as well. Um, <clears throat> sit to stand test, amongst others. The importance of knowing it here is just knowing it exists and knowing that how it's used, but you don't have to understand the numbers in detail. The modified Ashworth scale, this is used to assess muscle tone. Uh, it's a 0 to 4 scale, and 0 is no tone, 4 is the, the area is rigid. The challenge here is it's not really appropriate for Parkinson's because uh, with Parkinson's, they have rigidity or they don't have rigidity. So essentially, somebody's going to almost always have a four on the modified Ashworth if they have Parkinson's disease and you're assessing them. Uh, it is utilized because there's no other good assessments for muscle tone, um, but it's not something that should be taken as an objective measure. Berg balance, dynamic gait index, functional reach test, uh, all of these tests are, are tests that you should be aware of from some other courses, and if you're not, you will become aware of them throughout your time here. Uh, I've laid out some very general details here for you, but you don't, up until this page, you don't have, need to know any of those details. So here, you can learn, read this for your knowledge, but you don't know, need to know this. However, this page is extremely, extremely important. This is very likely to be seen on the boards. It will be relevant clinically, and will certainly be seen on your, seen on your test. So the uh, threshold values. So on the left-hand side here, you see uh, BBS, that's Berg Balance, DGI, Dynamic Gait Index, FRT is Functional Reach, and TUG is the time, get up and go. So these numbers here are indicative of a high risk for falls for an individual with Parkinson's. So if a person were to score a 46 or less on the Berg Balance Scale, and they have Parkinson's, Parkinson's, they're at a very high risk for falls. For DGI, the number is 19. If they score a 19 out of 24 or less, they're at a very high risk. Functional reach test, 25.4, and tug, an 8.5. Now, the tug is a measure of speed, so the faster, the lower the number, the better. So if they score an 8.5 or higher, they're at a high risk. Now, that said, um, the research is, again, very strong here, and the recommendation for Utilizing outcome measures for Parkinson's recommends that you first use the DGI. If it's positive for a significant fall risk, uh, PT is indicated. If it's negative, then you should test for the Berg, utilizing the Berg. If the Berg is positive, then a person's appropriate for PT. They need PT. If it's negative, then they might not need PT at this time. However, these are the recommendations put forward by the medical industry and uh, while they are appropriate recommendations, uh, I feel strongly, and the, the new research is showing very strongly, that individuals of all levels with Parkinson's should be on a very strict and strong exercise program that's been prescribed by a physical therapist. So whether they have balance deficits or not, they should be seeing a physical therapist. Now again, the standardized recommendations here are if there's a history of one or greater falls in the past year, they're at an increased risk for fall in the next three months obviously making it more appropriate that they have physical therapy. Falls occur most often during freezing episodes, and that occurs during positional transitions, and could be correlated with on and off uh, of the medical medications as well. So it's very important that you assess their fall risk in a similar clinical state and situation and med schedule. Um, if a person's going to be moving around their house more than anywhere else, which is often common, you should consider trying to perform a PT evaluation inside their home. Um, 
So for diagnosis, actually, there's some great new technology that can show the dopamine activity in the basal ganglia. You can see here on the right uh, through a PET scan, you can see under normal, the red is, the, is dopamine. Uh, below that the, is an individual with Parkinson's, and you see significantly less red showing less dopamine activity. So this is great because now we finally have a measure that we can look at an objective measure. Prior to this, uh, it was really a symptom-based diagnosis. So acute management is, uh, is through medications. Uh, it's extremely important that a person get on the appropriate medications as early as possible and obviously prevent any secondary damage as well. So uh, to kind of go through those, you have all the medications listed here. These medications are extremely important, uh, but something that you'll discuss uh, significantly more next semester in your treatment-based course. Okay. Now that said, I think it is important that you do read through these medications, understand what they are, and you can review these during your lab time with Dwayne Grill as well. Okay. Some of the challenges with the medical uh, management, there's these medications are impacting your basal ganglia, which are going to impact neurotransmitters. And as a result, anytime you affect neurotransmitters, you're going to have effect on another neurotransmitter. Neurotransmitters are all about a balance. And after watching the other video that is supplied, that should make more sense. So because of that, um, the medications can actually cause uh, significant uh, side effects, dyskinesias, orthostatic hypotension, even behavioral issues like confusion, hallucinations, paranoia, and psychosis. There's an on-off phenomenon in that the medications only last for a certain amount of time and they actually wear off. That's the, uh, so that's the on-off time. And essentially, if a person takes their medication at 8 a.m., you would want them to kind of track how they're feeling, how smooth their movements are. In general, what you'll see is about a four-hour window. So from 8 to 12 would be the time for that dose of medication if they took it at 8 a.m. And in general, around 10 a.m., they'll be at their peak or most effective dose. Uh, there is something else, not on-off phenomenon, however, wearing off phenomenon. So the wearing off phenomenon uh, is essentially when the medication is, starts to be less effective over time for that individual. Okay. So we should always manage secondary symptoms, the medical management, I should say, like Botox. Uh, there are some surgical approaches. However, the real standard is deep brain stimulation from a surgical standpoint. Uh, the deep brain stimulation, it's a sur surgical placement of electrode directly into the brain, directly into the basal ganglia, with electrical stimulation that actually triggers the substantia nigra to produce dopamine. Uh, for many people with Parkinson's, it's highly effective. However, um, it's unknown as to whether or not it's going to be effective until the surgery is tried or attempted. So unfortunately, there are a number of people who have the surgery and will not see significant improvements afterwards. At this time, there's really no other options aside from trying the surgery in order to see if it would actually work. As a result, as a therapist, you'll probably field a lot of questions with people asking you if they should or should not have it. And my suggestion is to refer to the most current research at that time. Uh, the research in Parkinson's disease is developing rapidly. It's very, very strong. And I would presume even if you're faced with this question in six months from now, there'll be a new research study uh, with some information for you. Okay, as of right now, the uh, deep brain stimulation inclusion criteria, they have to have idiopathic Parkinson's. They must respond to L-DOPA, uh, levodopa. Uh, ideally, their medical therapy is optimized or limited, uh, disabling tremor, dyskinesia, or motor fluctuations. So in, in essence, what we're saying here is they have to have significant impairment from the disease. Somebody's not going to have deep brain stimulation if they don't have significant impairments, secondary to the risk, of course. Exclusions. The absolute exclusions are atypical Parkinsonism, and that's because it doesn't work for atypical Parkinsonism. Uh, lack of response to L-DOPA, same answer. Dementia, uh, unstable comorbid conditions, including behavioral problems. So relative exclusion criteria is a presence of uh, uh, CNS disease or brain atrophy, cognitive dysfunction, coagulopathies, or unrealistic expectations for outcome.
the management here, generally the first programming is about one month post operation. Uh, it occurs every month until it's optimized. It does require annual maintenance checks and any magnetic field can actually switch off the DBS. So it's important that a person's careful about uh, where they are, uh, especially if they're near MRI or diathermy. Outcomes, uh, it is progressive, Parkinson's is progressive. And uh, in order to really understand the outcomes, you have to look at the two different types. So the two types are postural instability gait disturbed, PIGD, so it's postural instability gait disturbed, or tremor predominant. Tremor predominant actually has a better prognosis, reflecting a slower prog progression. Um, so ultimately the tremor might be worse. Uh, in, in general, the tremor does not respond to many medications. However, their overall prognosis is not as bad. Postural instability, gait disturbed, that, that variation has a, uh, a less good prognosis, although I say less good uh, because I refuse to say bad because actually the research is showing very good prognoses with the new treatments for postural. Okay. So signs and symptoms. This is really the crux of this lecture. Uh, I've broken this down to try to be as simple and clear as possible, and my hope is that it's an uh, easy, uh, easily accessible study tool. But to start, I'm just going to give you the first four, which are the most common. Uh, trap. So trap, T is tremor, or rigidity, A is akinesia, or, and P is postural instability. So trap sounds easy to remember. It's a good one to remember. Um, but the A is kind of cheap. So it's not really akinesia, it's bradykinesia. Some cases you'll see akinesia, it's a lack of movement, but in most cases you're going to see a slowness in movement. But if we had to be there, it wouldn't make trap. So the primary signs and symptoms uh, are listed out here. It's important that you do go through this. So here's your cardinal signs and symptoms again, with a little bit of a descriptor. And it's important that you read through this and understand the details of this. This is, again, the crux of this lecture and the crux of understanding Parkinson's disease. So make sure you go through, uh, look very closely at these four. Okay. And then after this, we also have a list of um, additional symptoms. Okay. Sorry. So the motor signs and symptoms, uh, these are additional symptoms. Uh, which are really uh, forms of the first four. They're forms of trap, uh, but broken down into more detail. Uh, so all of these symptoms are possible. Most of them are very common in Parkinson's. Again, this is very much level one information, so I think it's imperative that you read through it. Uh, I hate to say memorize, but it is important that you do know this, so you are going to want to make sure that if this is not if this does not come to you just by reading it, you want to make sure you go back, study it, and memorize it. Now, non-motor symptoms. Uh, so non-motor symptoms is a huge part of Parkinson's disease. PTs generally focus on motor symptoms, and in my opinion, this is a huge disservice to our patients. So it's imperative that PTs understand the non-motor symptoms and address them appropriately within the confines of our uh, reality within our knowledge base and within our practice act. Okay, so uh, treatment that does not take into consideration non-motor symptoms may not succeed, and that is clearly an understatement. In many cases, if you're trying to treat a movement disorder by training a person to move, but you don't, don't take into account the non-motor symptoms, like these behavioral or cognitive that are listed here, naturally you're not going to be able to have good outcomes with that patient. So again, read through these. Uh, there are a number of behavioral uh, non-motor symptoms, cognitive non-motor symptoms, as well as a uh, more detailed look at this gives you uh, some more of the non-motor symptoms that are causing most of the motor dysfunction. Uh, this is basically taking the brain, looking at the dorsolateral prefrontal circuit. Essentially, executive function is going to be impaired, and that's because the prefrontal cortex actually requires dopamine to function. Then you have your orbitofrontal circuit uh, that generally mediates your personality and socially appropriate behavior. This would be why a person might have a flat affect. And then you have your anterior cingulate gyrus, which causes, uh, which impacts depression and anxiety. Some of the others, dysautonomia, sensory problems, sleep disorder, 
weight loss, fatigue, and respiratory dysfunction. So I know we went through some of this kind of quickly, but uh, for the most part, this information is information that you can go through, read through, and understand uh, a majority of its level one memorization. The complicated information is discussed in the basal ganglia, and for that I've posted that additional video. Now this book, this iBook has PT interventions, uh, and it goes through in great detail the current PT interventions. You're welcome to read through this, you're welcome to utilize it. You will not be tested on this uh, in this course, but this will come in very handy for next semester and also for the boards. So you can uh, most definitely read through this. Thanks.